Thank you for welcoming me. I am Ben Burgett. Um, can we do a real quick activity before we begin? Um, please just get everything out of the way. Put it all under your desk. Um, except for this paper and pen, if you want, you can leave that behind. But everything else, just set it aside. Okay. And then you're all sitting in a chair, right? Pretend like your tailbone is bolted to both the back and the bottom of the chair. <laughs> so you know where this is coming from. In, in the LDS Church, I teach in others' form, and they always fall asleep. And so we do this little activity to get things going before we begin. Just close your eyes, take a deep breath in, and slowly let it out. Okay, now don't stop breathing, but pay attention to everything else. Press your feet into the floor just until your legs feel tense. Feel the earth underneath your feet. Feel that support. Okay, now while doing that, take a deep breath in and try to poke the top of your head through the roof of the building. Sit as tall as you can. Take another deep breath. Now roll your shoulders back and sit up as tall as you can in that chair, keeping your feet pressed into the floor and your head pressed into the ceiling and your tailbone bolted to the chair. And we'll take two really good breaths. your eyes. Try to keep your posture kind of nice. You should be more awake than you were. Um, <laughs> and now you're really wondering who is this guy. Right? Okay. My name is Ben Thurgood. I work for Sandia National Laboratory. I am an accounting cost analyst. Um, funny story about that is I was an econ undergrad. I started out as a business undergrad, but I didn't want to take a second accounting class. So I switched to economics. <laughs> and now I'm an accounting cost analyst in the indirect financial management sector at Sandia National Labs. Um, a brief story about indirect financial management is we're a government contractor, so everything has to come down to a specific direct government contract, right? A specific project and task. Well, if you have a building that 100 different tasks use or a manager that manages large programs, how do you build that time out or that cost out to a specific task? Right. So our department creates corporate taxes, corporate burden rates, and then a variety of other mechanisms to distribute these costs so that we comply with federal cost accounting standards. Um, I work at, but do not speak for, Sandia National Labs. Uh, in order to give a presentation that is endorsed by Sandia National Labs, there's a very big review and approval process, and I didn't want to go through that with this. So this is Ben speaking, not Sandia. I apologize, I have to keep my notes screen going along with my PowerPoint. San Diego National Labs is in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Um, I told maybe hundreds of people that I was going to Albuquerque, and the next time they saw me, they said, when are you going to Phoenix? There is a state called New Mexico, and there's a city called Albuquerque. And if you go down into that far corner of Albuquerque, there's an Air Force Base, the Kirtland Air Force Base, and that's where San Diego National Labs is. Sandia National Labs is a nonprofit organization owned by the federal government and operated by a private sector corporation. It's everything the MBA program could possibly be, right? Really all I have to say about that. Um, there's a website, sandia.gov, if you're interested in what we do and the neat stuff that goes on. I recommend checking it out. It really is a fascinating place. Um, the work that the scientists do there every day and that the business people enable makes our country safer and better. Um, this project is protecting people online, coming up with a better helmet, I believe. Here we're working on renewable energy, right? Trying to find new ways to power this nation. Securing our nation, we do a lot with national security. So www.sandia.gov. For those of you who are Spanish speakers, yes, Sandia means watermelon. Um, we are Watermelon National Labs. Named <laughs> after the mountains there in New Mexico. Okay. All 
although we do many things at Sandia, primarily we are tasked with maintaining the, nu the nation's nuclear weapons arsenal. Uh, when I interviewed there, they said, we make bombs, and you have to be okay with that. Um, you get a lot to, and you could get into a lot of political debate on The way I handle it is, we're making our nation safer and more secure, right? And I'm okay with that and what that means. So I'm going to talk about some of these other research areas. They're all on the website as well. When I look at a job, okay, kind of bad here. Oh, there we go. Okay. When I look at a job, there's three ways that I look at it. There's a core, there's a platform, and there's an asymptote. Right? The core is what you do every day. My job, I go and I sit in front of a computer and I run reports. I have meetings, I talk to people. Right? Um, I give presentations and I review and write policy. That's the core of my job, what I do for close to eight hours a day. Then I look at the platform. What will this position eventually lead to, right? Most people don't absolutely love their first job. It's not the dream they were aiming for. But where is it going to lead to? And then there's the asymptote. If you stuck with this position, stuck on this route, what's the highest and best thing you could achieve taking this path forward? Um, talk about that a little bit more. Does the BYU MPA fit at San Diego National Labs? Absolutely. The skills that I learned in this program I use every day. Um, I was an econ undergrad and I had a lot of analytical tools when I began. Um, there was a lot of analysis I could do, a lot of statistics I know, fun computer programs that I like to play with. I'm addicted to Microsoft Excel. But those aren't actually what I use in my job at all little bits here and there. The core things that I learned in this program are what I use every day. How to have a crucial conversation. How to give a presentation that gets my point across. How to tell somebody no without using the word no. Right? Platform. Like I said, Sandia is a nonprofit, government, for-profit organization. Right? It can lead to anywhere. So if you're not really sure what you're looking for right up front, this might be a good place to start out. And then as for the asymptote, well, it's up for you to decide. Um, I think if I stayed my right now, I would end up a senior manager. And I don't know if that's where I want to end up. That's OK. What opportunities are available at Sandia? So they're the same colors and the same format. They're supposed to fall on the same idea. Right? Responsibility, <laughs> the core of what you do every day. Um, there's a wide range at Sandia. When I came in, my very first week, they were having me put things into their software that affected every transaction at Sandia. If I put the wrong number in, thousands of things would go wrong, and it would take hours and hours to fix. And that was my first week there. Um, quickly, people started moving on in the positions above me. And within six months, I became the subject matter expert and area lead for this very intensely scrutinized <coughs> subject at Sandia called folding projects. Um, it's one of those mechanisms we use to collect costs and then distribute them so that they go from all these different projects to specific projects. Right? We get audited about four times a year by different government agencies. And I am the person at Sandia National Labs that's responsible for making sure that those audits don't go bad. <laughs> um, so you can quickly move up. Training as a platform, right? There are many training opportunities at Sandia, and that's one of the reasons I took that job. There's a thing called the Sandia Business School, where they have specific classes for how Sandia operates. Um, I think it's eight core classes to become a financial analyst, for real. Um, but there are dozens and dozens of classes. They have tuition assistance programs. You can do part-time education. If you want to go back and get a critical master's degree, they will pay you part-time um, to go to school full-time. And then mobility, asymptotes, right? Sandia rotates employees rapidly and dramatically. Um, about every two years on the business side, you are free to go anywhere you want. You could start out in direct finance and then end up in procurement and then be a project manager. Or even more dramatically, you could go and have them teach you engineering at night and jump over to the technical side. They are all about education and helping you grow in your career. 
This is also a website, but I won't click to that one. Um, it's just a list of all the different types of activities. Sandia is a 10,000 person organization. If there's a business function, Sandia performs it. We have HR, safety, auditing, accounting, payroll, anything you could imagine, it's there at Sandia. When I went to school, I had two friends, Tim and Anthony, um, and we all applied for this job at Sandia National Labs, and we all got position. We all got the exact same cover letter, or acceptance letter, and we all ended up in three very different positions. Tim is a project manager. He works with a team of scientists, and he helps them stay on budget and figure out how to pay for the things that they want to do. Ben works in direct financial management. That's what that's all about. And then Anthony is in procurement. He sets up contracts and deals with suppliers and makes sure that everybody across the labs can have access to the materials that they need. We all came from the same program. None of our backgrounds really match up with where we landed. Uh, a little story about this is I actually didn't know where I would be until 4 p.m. my first day of work. Um, and we're going to talk about that a little more. Some of the stuff that people really care about but never want to ask about, right? So benefits. Sandia has amazing work-life balance. You will, over the course of your career, work an average of 40 hours a week, um, period. I work on a 980 work schedule, so I work nine hours Monday through Thursday and eight hours every other Friday, and that's great. Uh, the second I've worked two hours over in any one day, it becomes flex time, which is just vacation that I get to use later. And that's great. That's actually how I'm paying for it today. I worked a little bit back in September during year end when it got busy, and now I get to take this time off. Sandia really values work-life balance. Time off. You start with three weeks vacation. That's pretty great. Um, insurances, they have them all. Health, dental, life, um, medical. Really great plans. And tons of training. Uh, educational benefits, tuition assistance programs. Um, internal trainings, getting sent to seminars. Any training you want, you can find a way to get it. Pay, so I know you make people feel awkward, but starting in a business with a master's degree at Sandia is about $60,000 a year. And then there's non-based pay, one to 2,000 or more or less every year um, as a bonus. And I'm not sure if that bonus is really based on anything. And then raises and promotions. You can step up a ladder. Um, you start out as a member of staff, you move up to a senior member of staff, and you get a raise when you get that promotion. And then also relocation. I moved, I had 19 apartments in Provo. <laughs> 19. Um, so I really know what it's like to move. And when they came and moved me to Albuquerque, I sat there grading final exams, and they packed up everything. I remember they had one plastic cup that they put in five pieces of paper. Um, and then they hauled it up to my third floor apartment and set it up for me. It was terrific. Um, and then they give you a little money on the side to set up your utilities and things like that. So there are really great benefits to working at San Diego. If that's what motivates you. Okay, one year ago, almost to the day, right? I was graduating. I'm not all that different than you guys. Um, the only real difference between me and you is that I put on this silly outfit <laughs> and they gave me a piece of paper that says I've finished what you're currently working on. Right? That's the big difference. So for all of this next stuff, consider the source. right? And if it makes sense and strikes a chord with you, then go with it or don't. The most important thing you will learn in life is to think for yourself figure out what your own answer is. Okay, so how did I get the job? Tanya sent out an email that said there are some suppliers in the lobby. Maybe not suppliers, that's what we say at San Diego. Um, there are people interviewing. So I walked out, <laughs> my newly brushed up resume, right? And I said, oh, they're not ready. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna not do it. And I walked out, went over, and went to class. But when I came back, they were still there. And so I ended up just handing them my resume. Right? I said, this is me. They took a look at it. Sandy really cares about your GPA. Mine was pretty OK. So they said, hey, you want an interview? And they interviewed me the next day. 
And then they invited me to come to Albuquerque. Um, that's the C event in the business staffing team. C stands for Science and Engineering Expo. I don't know how they hire business people in the Science and Engineering Expo. But they took me down to Albuquerque, they showed me around, and they tried to convince me that it was an okay place to live. Um, and then on Christmas break, I got an offer. I also had an offer from my internship with the city in the summer, and I had to decide which one to take. Um, and mostly for the training reasons, I decided that I needed to take this job in San Diego. Mostly, what I'm trying to get out of this is serendipity is how I got my job. I almost didn't handle my resume. And then it was just a whim of an interview, right? I had looked at places. I graduated with my undergrad in 2009. Every place I applied to fired 5,000 people when I sent in my resume, right? It was really tough. But when it finally happened and the time was finally right, it just went. And I can't tell you any magical advice for how do you get a job. I did everything wrong, right? I still got a job. So have faith, especially now, right? Those are my, my job giving tips, I guess. On the job, within six weeks of being at Sandia, I took over this long, detailed project that the person before me was working on and was supposed to have done, but didn't. It was a detailed impact analysis of changing a $111 million billing process at Sandia. We were going to charge space to a different account, right? space being office space, um, rent for people. And so after six weeks at Sandia, I had to give a presentation to the senior management of Sandia saying this is the change and this is why it's appropriate. This is why it follows cost accounting standards, although I don't currently know what those are. Um, and then I put a little notice in this article that goes out every day to the entire labs that said, hey everybody, we're doing this sweeping change. If you have any questions, call Ben Thurgood. Um, and so I'm the clown in front. Right? Leading the blind. And I remember a lady called up and said, I work in Oregon. And then she just listed off some numbers, because everything in San Diego is numbers. I said, well, I have no idea what that is. She said, how is this CAS compliant? I said, well, I have no idea what that is. Because um, I haven't been here two months, right? It's not always what you know. Sometimes it's just a matter of how good you are at searching for an answer. I didn't know anything that was going on at that point. I didn't know the rules I was supposed to be applying. I didn't know the projects I was supposed to be applying it to. I didn't know how things were done in the past. I didn't really know how things were going to be done in the future. Right? But somebody would call and ask me a question, and they were <coughs> angry. <laughs> so I had to keep them calm and say, you know, I don't know, but I can get back to you soon. And then it was a matter of knowing who my resources were. The guy over in accounting that I could talk to about this woman in the next desk over that knows everything about my job and just searching for that answer. I remember sometimes in this program thinking, just tell me how you want me to do this assignment. <laughs> just tell me what an A looks like and I will recreate it for you, right? And I know a lot of us feel that way sometimes, but it was searching for the answer, not being told what the answer is that prepared me for this situation. My little note here says, the greatest disservice you could do to yourself in school would be expecting somebody else to give you the answer. I don't care if you get a D on an assignment, if you thought about it yourself. Right? And that's really tough to say when so much depends on GPA. <coughs> so that was one of my successes, I felt like, at San Diego. Um, it was this really tough situation, I didn't really know what I was doing, but I jumped up the curve. And I was there, and I figured out the answer to people's questions. This is a failure I had at Sandia. I drive a Mini Cooper, that's why we have this dashboard. Mine is not British like this one. I was asked to give a presentation to our director, and I knew exactly what he had asked for, but I knew it was not exactly what he wanted. But I was new, and I wasn't quite sure of myself at this point. And so I gave him what he wanted. I made this presentation, and it was exactly what he wanted. And when I got done, he said, yes, that's exactly what I wanted. But do you know what I really need? 
and I just screamed inside, yes, I know exactly what you really need, and if I were an awesome stellar employee, I would have had that ready too, because I knew you needed it, right? But I didn't. And that was the last meeting of the day, and I was driving home in my little Mini Cooper, and having one of those out loud conversations with yourself, right? I was just screaming, I'm better than this. I learned this in school. I had a field study class, and I learned exactly to ask that question. They've told me what they want, but is it what they need? I learned that lesson, but obviously I didn't actually learn that lesson. We have so many tools in this program, so many things you've learned. Some of them are really hard tools, right? Technical tools. Some of them are really soft tools, like how to tell people no without saying no. Make a list. I have a checklist before I send an email. Is my bottom line up front, right? That I'd love if you guys had to feel bigger. Um, is it clear? Did I use bullets where there could have been bullets? It's totally okay to have reminders in front of you of the things that you've learned. Um, it's all out there somewhere, but it's not gonna be ready for you when you need it if you aren't actively trying to remember it. So there's an activity here too. I want everybody in the room to raise your hand as high as you can. Okay, now raise it a little bit higher. Right? So I asked you to raise your hand as high as you can, yet when I said raise it a little bit higher, everybody in the room went a little bit higher. Why do we do that to ourselves? Um, this one. So this is also from work. I took kettlebell class. And he is all about keeping his employees fit, especially the ones that sit at the desk all day. And the instructor said, once you think you have picked the right size bell, go one bigger. Right? We kind of size ourselves to our challenge, right? We think I can handle this many pounds on this exercise. And our instructor was convinced that with kettlebells, once you think you figured out how strong you are, you need to go one size bigger because that's what you're actually going to be able to do. Are you catching the parallel there? Okay. There's a book that I'm going to talk about a little bit more in a second. It's called Lynchpin. Um, but he has a quote. He says, trying and failing is better than merely failing because trying makes you an artist and gives you the right to try again. Right? There's absolutely nothing wrong with picking up a kettlebell that's a little bit too big and then saying, well, I bit off more than I can chew. I better back off. Right? Nobody's going to fault you for that. But it looks really ridiculous when you're standing there with a little two-pound ball pretending to be working when you're not. Life. Okay. This is a piece of picture, right? It's something nobody likes to talk about. Vulnerability. Does anybody want to guess what vulnerability means? Give me a definition. Having your weaknesses exposed for others can see. I venture to say that answering a question that you're not quite sure what the answer is going to be is being vulnerable, right? <laughs> I make myself vulnerable all the time. <laughs> That's good. Thank you for answering that. There's this book called The Gifts of Imperfection by Brene Brown, and she talks about living a whole hearted life. Right? She talks about letting yourself be vulnerable. One of the big things she talks about is the difference between guilt and shame. Guilt is the idea of I did something bad, right? And I need to make it right. Or I do something bad and I need to change my ways. Shame, on the other hand, is the idea of I am something bad. There's no room in our lives for shame. That is a completely inappropriate, completely inappropriate emotion. Right? If you need to feel guilty, go ahead and feel guilty. Right? But you should never feel shame. Vulnerability to me is recognizing that you should never feel shame. Right? It's recognizing that it's okay to screw up because you're not something bad. You're something good. Right? And so even when you try and you fail, or you hurt somebody a little bit, or you mess up, or you get it wrong. Right? Maybe guilt's going to be appropriate, but it's okay. 
I also learned that you are where you are, right? Wherever that is. And when you want to move forward, you have to start wherever you are, right? You can't start losing weight by automatically being 50 pounds lighter. It doesn't work that way. You start where you are, and then you move forward. challenge you to think about your lens. Think about the experiences you've had. And think about, do you feel guilt about things or do you feel shame about things? If you feel guilt, take care of it, right? But if you feel shame, you've got to let go of that. Maybe you can borrow that book when she's done. Um, she also has a 20-minute YouTube TEDx talk, Brene Brown. Um, I recommend going and watching that. Okay? But I expect great things out of life. And I expect great things from you out of life. I have this nasty habit of thinking it's too late, right? I've missed my chance. Um, I couldn't change careers now. I couldn't start a new hobby or pick up an old sport or do that thing I always wished I had done, right? But it's never too late to be what you might have become. And some famous person said that. I'm sorry, I can't remember who. For example, my 40-year-old brother just started finishing his bachelor's. Right? I'm so proud of him. My whole family was against it, thinking, just keep going with your career, right? Just try to make this thing work. But he decided, you know what, I don't care how late it is or how long I've waited. I'm going to go and do what I need to do in life. So he's 40, and he's in a class with 18-year-olds, but it's worth it. In my big classroom, the teacher had a sign on the door, and I can still see it, it's clear as day. It's this pasture with this beautiful starry sky above, and it says, it's better to aim for the stars and miss than to aim for a cow pie and hit it. <laughs> UAU has a motto, enter to learn. I'm not talking about your GPA. Right? Um, this is something that I've just recently really started to take to heart, enter to learn, go forth to serve. That is an amazing motto when you really buy into it. When was the last time you talked to a professor about something other than your grades? Or when you listen to somebody that you disagree with, talk about what you disagree about? When was the last time you tried something with at least a 90% chance of failure? When was the last time you told somebody something that you usually keep a secret? Your own secret, not somebody else. <laughs> <laughs> when was the last 
time you let yourself be heard, but you kept on trying. Okay. For those of you who interviewed with me today, I keep hoping this, I'm sorry. I talked about two different approaches to getting a job, right? There's a resume builder thing. Items that look really good, right? Like, I can use R. <laughs> I saved my company a million dollars by improving this process. Whatever it is, right? You know what they are. Those are the one-line items that you want to see on the resume. On the other hand, there's these things called relationship builders, right? It's who you are as a person, and it's what you do in your job. Resume builders get you an interview. They may even get you in the door. But relationship builders are what get you success. So here are some of my resume builders, right? I can make some fancy graphs. I can decompose data. I can forecast for trends, seasonality, error. I can do some really cool stuff in Excel, right? Make it absolutely beautiful. In my job, I have I have my one-liners. This is a little snippet from my very colorful resume. Right? Within six months, I was promoted to subject matter expert. That space analysis I told you about that I announced to the labs. I'm on teams that are increasing efficiency. I administer $137 million in accounts. There's a lot of stuff on here I'm really proud of. Right? Things I've done that make me feel good and that create value for my organization. And I'm proud of these things. But it's about going forth to serve. This was never about you. At least it never should have been. I came to school to get an education to provide for a family that I currently do not get. But that's why I came to school. Right? The longer that I don't have a family of my own, I'm learning that other people are my family. I have a family in this MPA program. And I reached out to them, and I'll talk about that later. Because you are here at BYU in an MPA program, I can guess some things about your motivation with relatively good actors. Right? Maybe you came here because you want to change the world or save some lives. Sometimes we look at the other programs in the married school, and we give ourselves a pat on the back for our noble intentions and our willingness to sacrifice. But I want to challenge that a little bit. Right? I don't care what you're studying or what you end up doing for a profession. If you do it with passion and a heart full of love, you're going to make a difference. I don't care what you're doing. I care why you're doing it. Here's that other book, Lynchpin. Okay. Seth Godin, right? <laughs> Are you all ready to answer the question? <laughs> I'm going to define a couple words for you here. Art. Art is that thing you do that's above and beyond what you're required to do. Right? So when your waiter makes your Saturday night dinner an extra special experience, he's created art for you. Right? When the grocer takes extra time to present the food in a really appealing way that makes your trip to the grocery store a little bit better, that's art. When my director asked me to give a presentation and I gave him exactly what he wanted, that was not art. If I had gone and done what he needed and gave him that extra piece, that would have been art. Right? Telling somebody no, that's your job. Telling somebody no in a way that makes them understand and accept that the answer is no, that's art. Everybody cool with that term? Seth Godin defines art. The intentional act of using your humanity to create a change in another person. The way Seth says to make art is to give gifts. And I love that idea of giving gifts, right? Just think about everything you do as an opportunity to give somebody a gift. Right? A gift would have been given my director that extra presentation. 
A gift is giving somebody a smile or a pat on the back because they look kind of down. A gift is going to your coworker who's working on a project and having a hard time and saying, hey, I think this little bit might help you out. Right? Figure out how you can give good gifts. Remember, you're going forth to serve. This was never about you anyway. Somebody read the title of this book and then wrote an article for Forbes magazine saying it's a ridiculous book. The title is Lynchpin, right? And the idea the author of the Forbes article got was a Lynchpin is that person in the organization who hoards knowledge and makes themselves absolutely necessary so that you can't get rid of them. Right? That is not at all what it means to be a Lynchpin. Becoming a Lynchpin is not an act of selfishness. I see it as an act of generosity because it gives you a platform for expending emotional labor and giving gifts. You best give a gift without knowing or being concerned whether it will be repaid, because the gift binds the recipient to the giver and both of them to the community. As a TA, I graded a lot of really boring stuff, right? If any of you are TAs, you understand. When somebody goes above and beyond, and they know the material, but then they put a little humor in there, right? A little joke. When you've been eight hours in front of a pile of tests, that's a gift, right? It's that little bit of joy in an otherwise very mundane task. Can somebody tell me about a time when they've received a gift, not an actual gift, right? But the kind of gift that I'm talking about. And then you'll receive the gift. <laughs> I have a good friend who recently moved to Arizona. We were friends for a few years, and for my birthday, um, a few months ago, I just walked into my home one day a few months ago, and um, there was a box from Amazon, and I didn't know who it was from. And I opened it up, and it was a book about how uh, being an introvert can make you powerful in life, <laughs> because we're both introverts. And um, it was an amazing book, because she knows her own personality, and she knows mine, and she gave me a book, just out of blue, um, to help celebrate them. Thank you. Now you get another book. <laughs> <laughs> Read a lot, that's great. Is that book called Quiet? I don't remember Power the name of the book. It has a gray cover, and it has Colorful right now. Is it that one? No, this one. No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm gonna brag a little bit about a time when I get a gift. This is better not squash soup, and those are red velvet cookies. Um, you're having a work potluck, right? And I decided to go above and beyond. These are two things I love to make. And so I made about 200 of these cookies. And I made about a gallon and a half of this soup. And I brought it into work the next day. And they had these nice little place cards. And they were labeled. And everybody knew what it was. And there were pictures. Because the cookies weren't put together. Um, the frosting was separate. Showing you, hey, you can make a sandwich out of these cookies, right? And everybody loved it. Right? It turns out that one of the senior managers at Sandia is a vegetarian. And there was nothing there that she could eat except for my soup. And then, well, everybody loves it. People were talking about that and talking about me for weeks after this experience. Oh, Ben, that's the guy who brought in all that really good food to our public, right? Oh, yeah, Ben made me a vegetarian soup. He didn't even know, but I'm so glad that it was there. Such a great thing for him to do, right? And of all the work that I have done at Sandia, nothing got me that much recognition as a weakness of soup. <laughs> so it's about giving gifts, right? Anywhere you can. Okay, an activity here. Reach out and touch somebody else on the shoulder. A different person with each hand. <laughs> Thank you.
Watchers and Wheels. What's up? We're done. We did a change a lot of time. I brought a cut to you. I like friends. chasing its tail, right? That is ridiculous. <laughs> Why would you want to chase your own tail? But if you want it, just go ahead and want it. That's part of being vulnerable. Today's book again, right? Because wanting something is scary. If I want something, I may not get it. Right? If I want that job and I apply, I may get rejected. If I want a promotion, I may get passed over, right? If you want something, you may not get it. It's going to hurt when you don't get it. But go ahead and want it anyways. So I was driving to work one day, and these thoughts started scrolling through my mind. Which day was it when you woke up and you thought you couldn't have what you wanted out of life? What day did that happen? How old were you when you decided that your dreams were too big and they'd never come true? When did you stop asking yourself questions and decide, and, and decide that this is it, this is all I get, this is what my life is going to be? Why? Why, why, why? to any of those. You sitting here in a master's program at BYU have sufficient means and opportunity to make yourself happy. You have the skills and the resources and the opportunities available to you to be as happy as you want to be. The motivation is just up to you to leverage those skills and those resources and become that happy. <clears throat> to let go of the shame that you feel in your life, right? And let that vulnerability in and want something. It's just really go out and want something and try 
as hard as you can to get it. What could possibly make you think that you don't get to be happy, but everybody else does? Right? That doesn't make any sense. You'll learn in ethics next semester. The rule's got to be a universal law for it to be an ethical one. Okay. This is me, the first time ever climbing outside. And it's about a 90-foot wall. It's rated a 510. If you know about climbing, 510 isn't beginner. It's kind of just you know, average. Um, this is my first time climbing up a wall, and it's about 100 feet tall, right? But there's always a first time for anything to do. I want to tell you a story about this wall. Three of the toughest mental battles of my entire life took place on this wall in the space of about 20 minutes. <laughs> I would get to a point, and there was just nothing. No handholds. I haven't been climbing that long. I've been climbing two months. This is very new for me, right? And this was about one month into it. And I didn't really have a clue what I was doing, but I trusted this guy. I thought he knew what he was doing. I still think he knows what he's doing. <laughs> But I had climbed up to a place on the wall, and I was stuck. I couldn't see anything. I couldn't see another handhold. I couldn't see another foothold. I couldn't feel any more strength in my arms, and I didn't know how to go one step further. And I knew if I fell off that wall right there, that rope would catch me, and I could go back down to the ground, and it would all be over. Right? Everything would be just fine. But you know, try after try after try, and then all of a sudden, it was the one littlest thing. I put my foot at a slightly different angle, or I noticed that there actually was a hole right here that I could get on, right? And then all of a sudden, I was 10 feet further up the wall, and having another one of the toughest mental battles of my entire life, thinking there's nothing I can do here. Eventually, the third toughest battle, I climbed completely in the wrong direction. I just started climbing way up to the left, and I think that's about where I am in this picture, is starting to go up and to the left, because it looked easy. It looked like an easy route. There were tons of big handholds, and I said, hey, I'm just going to go that way. I can do this really, really easily, right? And I climbed up there, and then I looked to where I needed to finish, and it was directly to my right. And then I looked down, and the wall had a curve in it so that I couldn't see anything below about chest height, right? <laughs> it's impossible. There's no way for me to get where I am at on this wall to where I need to be. It's just absolutely impossible. And I yelled down to my friend, I can't cross climb this. It's impossible. And he said, yes, you can. Just try. And then what he said was, I'm your belay man. I can leave you up here all day if I want. <laughs> and I was angry, right? <laughs> but then I started trying to cross climb. At this point, I had been on the wall for like 20 minutes because, like I said, this was my first time. Um, and I fell for footholds that I couldn't see. And I started climbing. And you know what? I fell. I fell right off the wall. But he didn't let me go down. I fell back to where I was supposed to be. Right? I got back on track, and then I climbed up from there, and I made it to the very top of that wall. And there was a video, but it's turned sideways, and I couldn't figure out how to turn it vertically, so I didn't put it in the PowerPoint. <laughs> but that was one of the greatest moments of joy in my entire life, was when I was hugging the top of that wall, and then I got to rappel down that 90 feet, and I had done the hardest thing I had ever done in my entire life. It took three huge mental battles, and it took falling when I went the wrong way for a while. But then I ended up back on track, and I climbed until I reached the top. So many parallels to your life, right? You all have a rope. If nothing else, you have the rope of this MPA program, right? You have friends that will be your delay man, that will support you and encourage you and try to get you to do the right thing. There will be times when you just want to quit, fall down, and give up, and never go back to this wall. Right? But if you can fight through that, you'll eventually make it to the top. There may be even times when you climb off the path for a while, right? Maybe you took the wrong job that first time, or just got distracted for a while. Right? But if it takes a fall to get back on track, then do it, and get back on track. This is a little bit later that same day. This wall was only about 40 feet high, way shorter. Um, 
this is me sticking my head in the crack and laughing because there's no way I can do what I was just asking. The wall got wider and wider and wider, right? And I was supposed to wedge myself out until I'm standing in the wall like this and then use one of my hands to clip my rope in. <laughs> and when my belay man told me that that's what he wanted to do, I just laughed. You know what? And sometimes it failed. I was in way over my head. That was a 5-12 round which is pretty hard, and it was lead climbing, the first time I've ever lead climbed in my entire life, which you know about climbing, is also hard. You know, sometimes it's okay to bite off more than you can chew, and to fail, and to laugh hysterically at it. People came from like hundreds of feet away to see what was going on. Okay, this is a mountain, this is the thing I emailed the MPA class about. I was jogging along the Bonneville Shoreline Trail, and looking at Mount Pinogas, and it was funny on top. And I had this vision, because I like to climb mountains, of how beautiful the tops of mountains are once you get there. Right? You can see everything. It's this glorious experience. But that day, I couldn't see the top of Mount Tepanogos, right? And I imagined climbing a mountain in the fog. You know you need to head up. And most of the time, you should be able to see the trail, right? But it's going to be hard, because you can't see where you're going. You know the general direction, but you don't know how to get there. You all have a mountain with an amazing view at the top. I know that, right? And you may not know exactly how to get there. And on the path, you may stumble and fall because you're in this fog, right? But eventually, you're going to make it to the top of this mountain. And it's going to be great. Quick story. One of the paths I almost took was I almost added a JD to my MPA degree. And this was my Adolson decision analysis. And it told me, go for it, right? Go get a JD. It's everything you want. So I did. I signed up for uh, LSAT study class, and I was sitting in class one day, and I looked out the window, and I saw a beautiful yellow tree. Um, the leaves were yellow. The bark was brown. <laughs> <laughs> and I just got mesmerized by this tree, and I wasn't paying attention to the class at all. And I was staring at this tree, and it got darker and darker outside. And you know when it gets really dark, windows turn into mirrors, right? And then I was staring at myself in the face. And the distinct thought came to my mind, as long as you are sitting in this room pursuing this course, law school, your yellow tree's out there fading away. That was the last time I ever went to that LSAT prep class. And I knew that that wasn't my path. Your yellow tree is out there. Right? There is something beautiful in this life that you are meant to do or become. In economics, you learn the true value of something is what you gave up to get it, right? The opportunity cost of this thing, the value of the next best thing. So think about that when you're making your decisions, right? It doesn't matter really what it costs money-wise. It doesn't matter what it costs time-wise. If this is the thing that you would give up all other things for, then it's worth it. From Lynchpin, loving what you do is almost as important as doing what you love, especially if you need to make a living at it. Go find a job that you can commit to, a career or business that you can fall in love with, and do your art. But don't wreck your art if it doesn't lend itself to paying the bills. That would be a tragedy. My art is not an accountant. I know that. But I am an accountant, and I can do my art. I have a bunch of really random quotes to end the day. There's a song. It's kind of a raucous song. But it has the quote, Never let your fear decide your fate. That's written in big letters on my bathroom here. Right? President James E. Faust said in the last talk he gave from the tabernacle in Salt Lake City, Brethren, take no counsel from your fears. Love that. Why would you ever listen to the voice in your head that is afraid? Right? Never let your fear decide what you're going to do with your life. My friend Anthony, who works at San Diego with me, said to me this week, if you really sat down and thought about what it is standing between you and what you really want, what's actually there? What's keeping you from having what you want? And he said, aside from you, probably nothing.
There are many people that I love in this program. One of them is Jeff Nelson. He gave me a copy of this book, East of Eden, um, when I was having a hard time here in this program. Have any of you read this? Anyone know what I'm talking about here? There's a word, potential. Right? Anybody know what potential means? It's Hebrew. It's from the Bible when Cain kills Abel. And this phrase means thou mayest. Thou mayest. Somebody want to read me a quote from the book? List. Now there are many millions in their sex and churches who feel the order, do that, and throw their weight into obedience. And there are millions more who feel predestination in thou shalt. Nothing they may do can interfere with what will be. But thou mayest. Why? That makes a man great, that gives him stature with the gods. For in his weakness and his filth, and his murder and his brother, he has still the great choice. He can choose this course and fight it through and win. Lee's voice was a chant of triumph. Adam said, do you believe that, Lee? Yes, I do. Yes, I do. It is easy out of laziness, out of weakness, to throw oneself into the lap of deity, saying, I couldn't help it. The way was set. But think of the glory of the choice. Thou mayest, right? I'll just let that one speak, please. Okay, another song. Music and dogs, that's what I'm all about. <laughs> and it gets lonely when you live out loud, when the truth that you seek isn't in this room. You better find your voice. You better make it loud. You've got to burn like fire or we'll just burn out. This is a song called Rebel Beat by the Google Dolls. Um, they are true is anywhere you look for them. Things I like about this, right? Is your art that unique thing, that yellow tree that only you can do for this world? That's not going to be in a crowd. That's going to be in you, right? It's your thing. Your voice, the truth you can speak into this world, isn't going to come from a crowd. It's going to come from within you. When you find that voice, make it loud. Do not be ashamed of the gifts that you have to give. Be brave about that. Whatever you can give, give it. If you've got to burn like fire, I'll just burn out. Okay. We've all got a journey ahead. It's just like a car, there's a really big forward-looking window and a really tiny rearward-looking window. And that's a great metaphor for life, right? You gotta look forward. Sometimes you gotta look back, check and see where you've been, right? But for the most part, you gotta look forward at this journey that lies ahead. My purpose today wasn't to give you any answers, it was to give you a whole lot of questions. Okay? Because I truly believe that your ability to answer, to ask your own questions and to find the answer is where you're going to find your success. So here is a whole bunch of questions. What is something you absolutely love? What is something you've always wanted but been afraid to try? What is the unique gift that you can offer the world? If you could live anywhere, be anything, do any job, what would it be? Is there anything outside of your own head that's actually in your way? How can you get over it? Get past it? What question are you uniquely qualified to answer? What help could only you get? What lives will you touch? What will you create? What impact will you have? Good luck. <laughs>